All right, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had uh, a good lunch and you, you recharged your batteries for the second half of the first day. This is quite an exciting session. That's why I volunteered to share it. Three very interesting presentations. The speaker of the second presentation is not here in the room yet, but he is in the conference. So hopefully we, we will see the second presentation. So we'll start with Johan van der Waal that will introduce us to Saga or refresh our understanding of Saga. To the speakers, uh, we have only one microphone. So in the Q&A, please walk to the person that is raising the hand and let the person ask, ask the question to the microphone so that gets recorded, all right? That's easy. Go ahead, Jürgen. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Johan and uh, first of all, I want to uh, tell that I'm giving this presentation. Uh, I'm not a core developer of Saga, I'm like the like maybe the fourth or the third or the fourth contributor. Uh, the two main authors, it's Olaf Konrad, who is in the University of uh, Hamburg. I think he's doing most of the work. And apart from that, there is Volker Wichmann also, who is in uh, Austria, and uh, who is also, uh, well, maintaining and developing Saga. But okay, I thought it had to be presented on this conference, so I did it. <laughs> so uh, who knows Saga? Okay, so yeah, maybe <laughs> that's a good thing. <laughs> anyway, I will uh, still give an introduction. Um, so actually, I like to call Saga GIS a toolbox rather than a full-fledged GIS system. Um, if you want to make very beautiful maps and don't do any processing or any analysis, you probably shouldn't use Saga GIS, but use QGIS or something else. Um, but the main thing that Saga is, it's a toolbox. It's a toolbox for doing uh, lots of different things. Um, we have toolbox to work with vector data, with raster data, with image data, a lot to work with digital terrains. Uh, that's actually why I still, or why I'm still using Saga a lot. Uh, this is because I do projects uh, that are related to soil erosion and uh, digital terrain analysis, like hydrology, sedimentation, those kind of things. And then apart from that, we have the more, let's say, common GIS uh, tools which are there, which you can use. Now, yeah, I, I told some people, not, not loud, but I thought the presentation was tomorrow, so I took some older slides. So that's why I changed the title to What's Old and New. So um, if, you, if you look to the number of tools, we have like a big increase. But if you would look nowadays, we are at 750 tools. <coughs> Actually, the increase is not that fast anymore. There are some reasons for that. And uh, that's actually that it became easier to combine different tools. So, I mean, before we would make a specific tool for something, now we just say, okay, just do that and that and that, and then you have a solution. So, uh, I thought about terrain analysis. Maybe some things which are interesting as well is everything related to point clouds. Actually, um, the person or the team which is in Austria, they have a commercial company and they even have a commercial version, let's say, of Saga. So it's actually Saga like the, the whole thing we have, but with some extra modules which have some extra functionality. But all the core of their processing is already in Saga, so it's very good for, do, for doing that. So how, how do you think about it? If I call it a toolbox, well, a toolbox, it means that yeah, you have a box with a lot of different tools in libraries. And this is an example of a tool. And usually it has a description and a reference that has been improved a lot. I mean, before we often didn't have a long description. And then if you look like below here, you have the parameters. But these are actually the things that you would enter. So for example, in this case, here you would enter elevation and you get an output, which is hill shade very easy module um, and there are some optional options below with default options this is actually the this is how a saga module looks you have a few inputs then maybe some outputs and, and that's it the same module can also be run from command line this is interesting for automating uh, purposes so instead of going to the interface and clicking you could run the same thing um, and then here you see the full thing, like dash elevation is, and then you can run it. 
that's actually the way that a lot of other programs use Saga. Uh, one example is the QGIS processing tools. So they, uh, they actually use that API. We ourselves generate some uh, ArcGIS toolboxes. Um, I didn't find a screenshot, so I just put a general one, but they have the same uh, principle. Also, Zoo WPS, so Zoo is an, uh, also a project, uh, I think it's in incubation for OSGO, which provide web services, so then you can use uh, WPS uh, to use these same tools. Um, finally, we have some ways to generate script files. Uh, this one is generating the Python API. Um, I myself, I don't really use it. This is mostly interesting if you want to, well, if you're if rest for your analysis in Python. What I usually do is use the normal command line API and call that from Python. I find it a bit more easy. Here you have to set up more things, but know it exists. Um, Okay, yeah, I'll come back to that. Um, yeah, this is a bit uh, a summary of what I said. There's also R. R has also a package which is linking to Saga, so you can also call these modules from R if you want. Um, what is interesting maybe from a developer point of view is that um, what I really like about Saga and how I became involved and why I still use it, I mean, there are some other products projects like uh, um, Grass.js. What I really like is that it's uh, like a quite small API, so it's quite easy to grasp it. Also, the, the interface, if you get used to it, it's very easy to do your analysis. And uh, it's actually very easy to develop new models, modules. So I, I just put a slide here showing the same module where I was talking about before. You have the input elevation and the output hill shading. If you look to the C++ code implementing this, this is actually everything. You have two places where you say, I want these parameters, and then you have a calculation which you could probably figure out if you look for a while what it does. It is not too complicated. What I mean with this is that this is enough to make a module, and then you have, well, actually, actually added a tool to Saga, and uh, it doesn't get I mean, it's not very hard. You don't have to know a lot of C++. I have some colleagues of mine who are doing a lot of things in Python, and they have rewritten some of the things to, to be Saga modules because it runs a, a lot faster. And uh, they were actually surprised by how easy it was. Um, yeah, we do have a graphical user interface, and it's quite nice, especially if you work with raster data. It can do a lot of things which I think, which I find harder in, uh, for example, QGIS. If you want to really like look at data to like think and understand how they work. So for example, if you zoom that uh, the, the colors will automatically stretch that you can see the values that you can do those kind of things. Um, and apart from that, we do support a few things. We even have a print layout, but I, uh, if you really want to make a beautiful map, you probably <laughs> have to make it in another program. I'll skip this part. Okay, yeah, I didn't tell this, but we are, this is an important thing. We work, or Saga works on different platforms, Windows, Linux, Mac. Uh, we don't have a Mac maintainer, so we somehow build it and people use it. But if somebody of you is really good at that, please get in touch. Um, we'd be happy. Now, one of the things which not many people know, because I was talking about this Python API, by the, about the scripting API, is that, yeah, it's a bit of pity that because it's a PDF, you don't see it in different steps, but if you run an analysis, for example, you run three different modules in your toolbox, and you then go and you click on the, on the layer which you just used, then you actually get the history. And that history that shows you which tools were used with which options. This is a, even true if you save the file and then reopen it, and you can still see the history. It's a very useful feature, because then you remember how it was done. 
And if you right click on the history, you can say save as tool chain. What that will do is create an XML file, which then in itself can be used as a new module. We call it a tool chain. So this is actually, I just did it this morning. I did save as tool chain and I added it. And at that time I have my inputs and my outputs. The input is the input I used in the, in the first uh, step. And then I think, I think I did three different steps. So the first one was make a hill shade, then do a calculation on that and then make shapes from it. So if you would look very closely, here you see, well, no, here you don't see it, but here you can see I have an elevation and I have polygons as output. This is actually my tool which I made without programming. It just does a few of these steps. Okay. So that brings me a bit to what's new. I mean, everything I said before, this has been in Saga for a while. Maybe it's not been used a lot, but uh, it's, uh, it's still very good to know. I, I see that many people who use Saga don't know about the possibilities. Uh, maybe I should give a workshop next Phos4G. Um, some of the new things. The first thing is we have a, a new grid format, or it's, uh, you can choose it. It's actually a zipped combination of all our files. Normally you have a few different files, then you get only one, which is also generally smaller, which is quite easy to work with. It's also supported in GDAL, so you can, I mean, if you have a recent system, you can save it with Saga in that format and use it in all the others. I think even Esri now can open it. Then something which, uh, like, we, we haven't supported for a very long time, and people have always found that strange, and I still think it was quite okay, but anyway, we can now do live reprojection of layers in the graphical user interface. So if you add two layers with a different projection system, you can show them together on a map. It is useful in a lot of situations. You just have to be, uh, well, you should know that if, for example, if you want to use a toolbox, you first have to reproject it yourself and then only you can use it. Uh, most of the time, if we are, for example, doing analysis on uh, a grid system or on a grid, we require you that you first uh, put both of the files in the same grid system and then do your analysis. So that are, that are two steps. You can, if you want to do that frequently, make it a tool chain. Combining those two, cha two steps, there's nothing wrong with that. But the reason why, or one of the reasons why I think it is a good choice to do it is that you know how you resample your data. If you don't know how it does, um, you might make errors, big errors. Uh, something else which was added are grid collections. So for example, if you have hyperspectral data or if you have climate data, um, you have a lot of different grids. Uh, so first of all, we have added support for that just as a, a file format, but also in the API. And uh, based on that, we can do new things like 3D interpolation um, of, of those layers. Yeah, this is the part where I didn't find a nice picture. So the, the new pictures, uh, the new modules, um, I forgot a, a big group are climate related modules because uh, well, people have been working a lot with Saga.js on or for climate modeling. Um, but apart from that, there are some uh, like a lot of classification things, uh, geomorphological things. Maybe this is interesting to know. One of the key developers is actually a geomorphologist turned into a bit an IT person, but he still prefers doing those kind of things. Um, it's a bit the same for me, actually. Um, another thing is that we are, have much better support for Unicode. Uh, there is a Russian translation now, um, which works uh, also very well. And then uh, the last point is might interest, I think, for example, the people from who are integ integrating uh, using QGS, is that we can, this is something we could actually already read, so we can read, uh, I mean, if the GDAL module is present and if GDAL is found, but that's generally the case, we can already read directly uh, uh, other file types, but now we can immediately write to, for example, GeoPackage, which is interesting if you want to have this like longer than 10, character headers huh? instead of a shapefile, it's limited. Um, 
So this is a small thing, it's actually something I made. Um, yeah, this is not really new, this is was there before. But in the graphical user interface, we can also integrate with uh, a databases directly. And then, while well, I was talking about the 3D interpolation, uh, there is actually quite some 3D support in Saga. Um, it is mostly in modules, so it's not really integrated yet in the rest. Um, but yeah, you see we are really working on that as well, especially in the tools. So the tools, the API supports 3D. Um, the visualization is still a bit of a hard problem to tackle. Yeah, that was my last, last slide. This may be, just this is one example, but there are a few more examples of places where we use Saga, not for GIS-related things. So one project uh, were like 10 sections of soils and of uh, geological samples. Uh, so they make a thin slice, they let light shine through it. And we used uh, object-based uh, image recognition to find out which minerals were inside in which uh, uh, like, uh, ratio. This is something which is easily possible. I mean, it are just images you can use. This is an example of a, a point cloud of a skull. And uh, I don't exactly know which kind of analysis they did, but they also used Saga for processing the data. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, w one more. I, I have put some links to places where you can find info on Saga. Unfortunately, I didn't update it, but I think it's still quite, quite okay. Uh, you can definitely talk to me during the conference, and uh, I, I'd be happy to take questions. I, I'd like to know what you do with Saga and what you don't do with Saga. <laughs> So uh, I have a question. Like I, I'm sure that I'm not the only one. Like using Saga from the like a tool in your work, workflow is like in general something that is combined with uh, also other other uh, processes from other data. And I find it quite painful that the exports of Saga are always in the S dot format, which is the Saga grid. That in the next chain you have to then if you want to use it in another tool, transform it in a in a through GDAL in a format like GOT for something that the other is using. And I find that this transformation can just be problematic also because when you transform it, it gets different null data than the other one that were in the input raster and stuff like that. So my question is, did you ever think to implement the output in another format than just the Saga grid? I thought about it two days ago. <laughs> no, um, we will do that. But uh, exactly the same way that we did it for GeoJSON or and, and uh, GeoPackage. I have been thinking, like, why don't we support like one type of TIFF, which is with reasonable defaults, like use styles. And I, I think it it makes a lot of sense. It's also not hard to implement the same way that we did it with GeoPackage and GeoJSON. I think we should. I mean, I'll discuss it on the mailing list, but. I see also use cases. When you say you can read and write the uh, geo package or geo JSON, and will you preserve the like longer attribute column, or will you internally, or will they get lost in uh, if you run them through a Saga model? And I haven't actually tried it, but uh, I know that we support longer inside the API, so I. I think it will get supported. I, I think it will work. More questions? We still have some time. Uh, what can we expect from Saga next? Well, I thought about the 3D and uh, like things we that have been added like recently is more things related to 3D ex interpolation. Um, apart from that, uh, we are, I mean, it's a small team, I just said it. There's one person working on it a lot, but it's not his day-to-day -day job. He's, uh, he also has to teach in university. So I, if you really want something, I'd say uh, come up and help out. It's, it's really easy. It's a very good, I mean, in, 
It's, it's actually quite easy to get started. Um, yeah. If you have any suggestions, please let me know. If it's not too much work, we might do it. <laughs> yeah, maybe one question which I expected is uh, <laughs> because I, I, I told this is the LTR, and you see we are at version 7, and the, fir the last LTR was 2, so has that much changed? No, we actually have changed the version numbering, like uh, to to make it really clear. If there has been any change in the API, we we bump the the version. And actually, I thought I had a slide on that. I, I didn't see it. Um, but for example, at one point we dropped uh, support for GeoTrans for transformations, and we only use Proj now. So that was a reason to get up uh, one higher version because it would mean that old things not necessarily are still working. But 99% or, no, that's too much, let's say 95% will still work. <laughs> okay, so we can close it there. Um, we'll have now the usual recess so that people can hop around the rooms and we'll resume this session at three with the next presentation. <laughs>